Th thank you ever so much to the University of Padova and to the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you everyone for joining the discussion. Um, and I'll, I'll try and say something to complement the, the excellent presentations we've just heard. Um, and uh, I think one common theme coming out of all three of the previous presentations is, is how complicated it is to think about climate justice in the context of fossil fuel extraction. So what I'm gonna do is try and share some research The, the issues and, and think about what are the principles by which we approach climate justice in relation to phasing out fossil fuel extraction. Um, I think the, the starting point for me is that the vast majority of fossil fuel production needs to be phased out um, within less than a generation, in, in less than 30 years. You see in this graph a, a number of um, pathways for oil and gas production that would be aligned with 1.5 degrees. Um, Generally, they see 70 to 85% redu reductions in global oil and gas production by 2050, generally between about 25 and 50% reductions in this decade alone by, by 2030. And if you remove all reliance on carbon dioxide removal, um, it, it becomes even faster. If we don't rely on, on uh, problematic or unproven carbon dioxide rem removal methods, then we, we would be looking at effectively a 100% reduction by 2050. So the transition has to take place this decade. The, the problem of climate justice at its heart, in my view, is that um, climate change is primarily caused by uh, the excessive historical emissions of wealthy countries in the global north. The impacts of climate change are felt most profoundly in the poorer countries of, of the global south who did far less to, to cause it. The, the global north countries have far more financial and other resources to transition, yet their, their pace of transition has been incredibly slow over the, over the 30 years um, in which climate change has been negotiated. Um, and, and generally, the, the approach to think about this, to, to incredibly simplify it, has been uh, common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, which in, a simple, in simple terms means that the countries of the global north must move first and fastest to, uh, to reduce their emissions, phase out fossil fuels, um, and they must provide significant finance to enable other countries, poorer countries, um, both to go through transitions and to cope with the, uh, the consequences of climate change. Um, now, as I say, I'm, I'm greatly simplifying that, but when, when we try to apply these principles to fossil fuel extraction, we find that they don't translate quite so neatly, and that's because of a couple of complications. The first is geology. Whereas all of the countries of the world emit greenhouse gases, not all of the countries of the world extract fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are only extracted in countries that have fossil fuel reserves. Similarly, there is a much less clear correlation between benefit from historical extraction and benefit from historical emissions. For instance, a country like Norway has, has done very well out of its oil extraction. It's built a, an effective uh, welfare state. Other countries have suffered from the resource curse. If you look at what's happening with gas development at the moment in Mozambique, it's led to a dramatic increase in, in corruption, in conflict. Many people have lost their homes. It, it is, if anything, increasing poverty rather than, than decreasing it. So in, in many countries are not benefiting from fossil fuels in the same way that, that perhaps there is more of a correlation with benefit from um, emissions of greenhouse gases. And that's even more the case um, when, when we look at um, particular people and, and groups within countries. Daniele men mentioned, mentioned this in, in his presentation. There's a big difference between people who benefit from fossil fuels, even depend on fossil fuels, workers in the fossil fuel sector, communities, those dependent on revenues, and those who are harmed by fossil fuels, um, people who lose their livelihoods to, from fossil fuels. For, for instance, due to, due to pollution, there is often very heavy repression associated with, um, in, with uh, protecting fossil fuel extraction. So, um, what we need to do when we think about climate justice is navigate through the, these, these complexities at the same time as, as recognizing the sheer urgency of, of the climate threat, as the previous speakers have, been meant, have, have mentioned. Now, to start with the area of this problem that, where I think there's the most agreement, um, I think it, it's very broadly agreed that there should be a just transition. And it's very broadly agreed, in principle at least, 
on what a just transition should look like. The various um, commentaries and, and discussions of just transition, whether from the labor movement or from scholars, I think all of them, I think it's fairly fair to say, have some variation of, of this set of principles, which I've, I've summarized here. We need to see investments to create alternative jobs, to diversify local economies. We need to ensure that there is training and skills development to enable fossil fuel workers to get those new jobs. There needs to be a social, there need to be social protections for, for workers and communities as they go through the transition. Um, as, as some people are without jobs for, for a, a temporary period. And all of this needs to be conducted through a, through a process of democratic consultation. Now, part of, and so the principles are agreed. I think the, the experience of applying them is much more nascent, but there are some good examples around the world. Part of the problem here though, is whose employment rights are we talking about? Now, in, in my view, a farmer or a fisher whose livelihood depends on um, minimizing the impacts of climate change has just as many employment rights as a coal miner or an, or an oil worker. Um, I think there is a danger that people tend to prioritize the rights of, of the fossil fuel workers over the rights of, of workers who, who will be affected by climate change. I think that's maybe partly because the fossil fuel jobs are, are more tangible. We know who has those jobs. We know how many jobs may be lost. Um, but I would argue we, we have to consider all people's jobs um, with equal priority. Um, and in particular, we need to not slow down the transition for the sake of one group at the expense of the other group. The ITUC puts it very pithily when it says there are no jobs on a dead planet. Now, um, I'm, I'm sharing it in this next slide. This, this is um, partly to illustrate this point. This is taken from a study that I was involved in, that, uh, which was published a few months ago. And what you see here is the, um, the oil emissions from the oil, gas, and coal, which are in fields and mines that are already in production or already being developed. So if, as the IEA recommended last year, no new oil fields, gas fields, coal mines were developed beyond those that are already in existence. How much oil, gas and coal would you get if when the, the existing fields and mines were run for their full economic life of a few decades? And that's shown here. The, the number a bit over 900 billion tons is 60% higher than the world can afford to burn while, while staying within 1.5 1, 1 degrees. So what, what this slide tells us, what, what this study tells us is not only do we not need to stop um, developing new fields and mines as the IEA recommends, we also need to close a large number of the existing ones. Now, how do we do that? That throws up big questions for climate justice. Um, which fields, which mines should be closed early? In which countries, who should be, who should be affected by this? And even in, in, the, um, in the poorest countries, just just stopping development of, of new fields in countries like Angola or Iraq will mean decline of, of production, which will have a profound effect on those countries' economies. Even there, there is going to be a need for significant support to transition their economies, significant financial support and other forms of support. So I'm going to share a few reflections on, um, on, on these kinds of, of issues. Now, this, this graph is, is taken from a, a study I worked on with my good friend and colleague, Shivan Katha. Um, and we're, we're starting to think about what are the relative impacts of transition on different countries. We start with employment in coal mining. Coal is the, the most labor intensive of the three fossil fuels. And in, in this graph, we're comparing two countries. Now, Germany, where there, there have been um, massive debates about how fast to phase out uh, lignite mining and, and combustion. Uh, for a long time, the, um, the target was 2038. Since, since the current government took office, that's been brought forward to 2030. Now, Germany has about 15,000 coal miners, and certainly the challenge of ensuring a just transition for those workers is, is non-trivial. Um, but they account for less than half of one worker per 1,000 workers in Germany. It's a, it's a very small share of, of the overall total. Compare this to China, which has 5 million coal, coal miners, um, and it's a much larger share of the total employment of the country. It's about five out of every thousand workers. Now, if that number doesn't sound very, very high, rem remember that they are very concentrated, these jobs, in the areas of the country where the coal deposits are, are located. And so what, what this graph shows us is that China has a much more 
we're thinking about this on two dimensions. China has a more difficult just transition um, because it's a larger share of its workforce is tied up in coal mining. It also has much smaller economic and other resources than Germany to enable that just transition. And so I would argue that, uh, and now we, we can, I, I, I can add some other countries onto this graph. Now we see the 10 largest coal producers in the world. Now I would argue that the further to the right a country is in this graph, the more difficult it will be to transition. So the more time the country should be given and the, the further down it is, the less income it, it has to invest in a just transition, the more it will need climate finance in particular from the wealthiest countries in the global North. Now the, the next graph, Harjit very kindly already um, showed. Thank you, Harjit. So that saves me spending uh, time on it. Um, but um, just, just to, emphasize a little bit of, of the importance here. Um, when you look at the right hand side of this, you see governments whose revenues, whose public sector revenues are very dependent on oil. In Iraq, 85% of government revenue comes, comes from oil. In Timor-Leste and Congo, it's, it's, it's about 60%. Now, wh where does that money go? That's, that's money that has to finance the just transition. It's money that pays public sector salaries. It's money that pays that provides for public investment. So we, we think about just transition for coal miners or oil and gas workers. In, this, in these kinds of cases, we also need to think about just transition for the nurses, for the teachers, for all public sector workers. And so to start to reduce that um, majority share of, of, uh, of government revenue will be very challenging for these countries. And another respect in which it, it's, it's challenging, I'm sharing, uh, I wasn't involved in this research, this is from um, researchers at the University of Sussex. Um, they, they looked at 30, 35 oil exporting countries, the largest oil exporters in the world. And they looked at how has dependence on oil declined over time. Now what these graphs show you is non-oil share of exports. So a country which is diversi diversifying will see its line increasing because non-oil is increasing its share. And what they found is of these 35 countries, only nine have consistently increased non-oil share over recent decades. The other 26 have all um, decreased the non-oil share, i.e. they have increased their, their dependence on oil. And when you look in more detail, the, the problem gets perhaps even worse. So take one which on the face of it looks like one of the more successful cases, Indonesia, on the right-hand side in this slide. So Indonesia's non-oil share of it of exports has increased from about 50% to, to 90%. Now, invert that to oil share, oil share of exports has declined from 50% to 10% over about 40 years. But in Indonesia's case, this is not driven by policy. This is primarily driven by the oil running out, the fields being depleted. And so um, it wasn't that Indonesia had a successful set of policies, it was kind of forced to do this. On the left-hand side of this graph, you see Saudi Arabia, which which since the 70s, I would say economic diversification has been Saudi Arabia's biggest policy priority. They keep, the government has repeatedly emphasized this. Now in those 45 or so years since, while this policy has been a top priority, non-oil exports have increased from 2% from to 15%, i.e. oil is still 85% of exports in spite of all this effort that has gone over for more than 40 years into diversifying. Now I'm going to skip this slide because I know we're short of time and just go on to, on, on to my last slide, um, which is, this is also from the paper I, I did with, with Shivan Katha, um, trying to pull together all these, all these strands that I've been talking about and how do, how do we think about climate justice in, in the managed phase out of fossil fuel extraction. We, we proposed five principles for thinking about this. The first principle is that the pace of phasing out global extraction must be consistent with limiting, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. We can't determine the pace based on how, what makes it easier to do a just transition because that would simply prioritize fossil fuel workers over other types of workers. The pace has to be determined by climate limits. Just transition though is equally important. That's our second principle, but the way in which transition, according to those principles, which we looked at earlier, um, not the pace at which we transition. The third principle relates to the, to the fact that many people are harmed by fossil fuels. Um, so 
in some countries of the world, in some regions of the world, think of the Niger Delta, think, think of uh, parts of uh, the Amazon rainforest, as, as Daniela talk, talked about, um, people's rights are fundamentally impacted by ongoing fossil fuel extraction. And those areas have to be a, a priority to shut down fossil fuel extraction as soon as possible. Um, I, I would argue that where extraction fundamentally violates rights, it should be stopped immediately. And that's where Daniela's work on the, on the Atlas is just so important. So that's our third principle that environmental justice has to, has to shape this. The fourth and fifth principles draw from the, those last few graphs comparing the challenges for, for different countries. Now, we argue that extraction should be reduced fastest where it will have the least social impacts. And broadly, what that means is the more dependent an economy is on extracting fossil fuels, the more workers it has dependent on it, the more government revenues it has on, dependent on it, the more its economy as a whole rests on fossil fuel extraction, the more time that should be, should be given to, to phase it out. And then finally, climate finance is absolutely crucial to any, any notion of, of uh, climate justice or, or equity. Um, as, as I said earlier, ev even countries which aren't um, closing down existing fields, just stopping developing new ones, where they are highly, some of, the, some of those countries that are highly dependent on, on fossil fuels and have uh, often very low income, there has to be financial and other forms of support to enable them to, de to decrease that dependence. It just won't be possible otherwise. So we, we hope that these five principles help contribute to a framework for thinking, thinking about how do we achieve climate justice in this complicated area. Um, thank you ever so much for, for listening to me and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the debate.